Coming up on Market to Market, U.S. crude oil production surges despite controversy over its impact on the environment. And a group of dedicated collectors preserve America's agricultural heritage by saving seed. Those stories and market analysis with Naomi Bloom, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success. This is the Friday, October 26 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Government reports this week revealed positive developments in America's manufacturing and housing sectors. According to the Commerce Department, orders for big-ticket durable goods rose almost 10 percent in September. That's their largest monthly gain in nearly three years. Much of the improvement was due to surging demand for commercial aircraft. Stripping out the volatile transportation sector, orders rose a more modest 2 percent. But orders for core capital goods, a barometer of future business investment, were unchanged. Earlier in the week, government reported that sales of new U.S. homes rose 5.7 percent last month to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 389,000, their highest level in two and a half years. And crude oil prices fell more than $4 this week as the government reported a massive 5.9 million barrel increase in domestic supplies. U.S. crude production also is surging. In fact, America soon could overtake Saudi Arabia as the world's top oil producer. Driven by high prices and new drilling methods, U.S. production of crude and other liquid hydrocarbons is on track to rise 7 percent this year to an average of 10.9 million barrels per day. That would mark the fourth year of increasing domestic production and, if realized, would be the largest single-year gain since 1951. According to the Energy Department, domestic production of crude and other liquid hydrocarbons, including biofuels, will average a record high of 11.4 million barrels per day in 2013. That would be a record high for U.S. production, less than 2 percent below Saudi Arabian output of 11.6 million barrels. However, the U.S. is still a long way from energy independence. Currently, America uses 18.7 million barrels per day, but thanks to growth in domestic production and improving fuel efficiency of the nation's cars and trucks, analysts believe imports could be cut in half by the end of the decade. A relatively new and controversial process known as hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, is squeezing oil out of rock once believed to be too expensive to tap. But it's also raised concerns in some regions that contaminated water produced in the process could leak into drinking water. Wood McKinsey, an energy consulting firm, estimates production from shale formations will grow from 1.6 million barrels per day this year to 4.2 million barrels per day by 2020. IHS SARA, another energy consulting group, estimates the boom in unconventional oil and gas production already supports nearly 2 million U.S. jobs and estimates that number will grow to 3 million positions by the end of the decade. However, increased production hasn't translated to cheap gasoline. Despite recent seasonal declines, prices at the pump are expected to stay relatively high in the years ahead due to increased demand for oil in developing nations and political instability in the Middle East and North Africa. U.S. oil and liquids production reached a peak of 11.2 million barrels per day in 1985 when Alaskan fields were producing enormous amounts of crude. But over the next 22 years, domestic crude production declined by 44 percent. As recently as 2006, the U.S. imported nearly 60 percent of the oil it consumed. By the end of this year, U.S. crude output will be at its highest level since 1998, and oil imports are predicted to fall to just over 40 percent of consumption, their lowest level in two decades. The International Energy Agency forecasts that global oil prices, which have averaged $107 a barrel this year, will slip to an average of $89 over the next five years. While the decline isn't expected to force oil companies to scale back exploration and production, it's also not a big enough fall to bring back the days of cheap gasoline. But with more of the price at the pump flowing to domestic producers, the U.S. economy is expected to get a much-needed shot in the arm. 
In addition to choosing a president next month, voters in California will say yay or nay to a controversial proposal relating to genetically engineered foods. Proposition 37 would require labeling of retail foods made from plants or animals with genetic material changed in specified ways. While some products would be exempt, the mandate would prohibit marketing such food or other processed food as natural. In recent years, genetically engineered crops have gained widespread acceptance, but some growers have discovered the benefits of planting seeds that were grown decades and even centuries ago. A case in point can be found near Decorah, Iowa, where the Seed Savers Exchange collects thousands of heirloom vegetables, herbs, flowers, and plants, making it one of the largest non-governmental seed banks in the United States. And as producer Judy Blank discovered, the nonprofit organization preserves America's rich agricultural heritage by saving seed. Sunlight filters through verdant gardens at Heritage Farm, headquarters for Seed Savers Exchange. The thousands of heirloom varieties in the Seed Savers collection have been passed down through generations of farmers and gardeners and are valued for their genetic diversity and adaptability to pressures such as climate change. Seed Savers' mission is to preserve and share this agricultural heritage with its membership and the public all over the world. There's a lot of moving parts to Seed Savers, and all of them kind of come back in some way to our core mission, which is to maintain heirloom seeds, distribute them, educate the public about genetic diversity, why is it important. Many of the heirloom varieties in the collection are donated by people who become members of the organization and share seeds that have been grown by their families for generations. The handing down of seed is what inspired Diane Otwaley to co-found Seed Savers Exchange in 1975 with her former husband, Kent Whaley. Diane's grandfather, Baptist John Ott, gave her morning glory seeds that were brought to America by his ancestors. I'm holding this handful of seed that I'm linking back to ancestors in another country that I never knew about or thought about. I felt the magic in that seed um, was bringing my family into my life. In 1986, Seed Savers Exchange expanded to the 890-acre Heritage Farm, where Grandpa Ott's morning glory continues to flourish. And now when you think about the power of that little seed, we have 13,000 people that are members, we have 24,000 different accessions of seed in our collection, and we've grown into this beautiful, beautiful paradise, and all from a little seed. The gardens are living classrooms that are open to the public. Seed Savers offers various educational resources, including online webinars. While its primary purpose is to educate the public about heirloom plants, the history of the seed plays a vital role in Seed Savers' goal of preserving America's garden heritage. You have the Phoebe Vincent heirloom. Our seed historian was able to get the backstory on that by emailing the great-great-granddaughter. We were able to get more of a story and background to the bean as well as give the seed back to the family because they had lost it. The organization also helps the public learn about seed saving techniques that are no longer commonly known. Heirloom seeds are seeds that are open pollinated, meaning that the, the seeds can be saved from the fruit, grown out the following year, and you're still going to have fruit that's true to the parent type. Heirloom comes in in the sense that it's been handed down generationally. Most farming in America prior to World War II involved open pollinated seeds where the farmers would select seeds from the harvest to be their seed stock for the following spring. The Millennium Seed Bank Partnership estimates between 60,000 to 100,000 horticultural varieties, about 25% of all plants, are in danger of becoming extinct. Seed Savers founders believe genetic material in open pollinated seeds could be critical to our future survival. In many cases, they've had a chance to adapt to many climate conditions and over the years have turned into a very strong plant. And I just think that who knows what we're going to need for plant breeding in the future. A hundred years from now, we might not know what seeds in our seed bank are best adaptable to the conditions that might exist, say, here in Decorah, Iowa. The historic apple orchard at Seed Savers Exchange displays hundreds of varieties of 19th century apple trees. But Seed Savers says those represent only a small fraction of apple varieties that have survived. Our orchard manager at Seed Savers' his name is Dan Bussey, and he's also an apple historian and he's working on a book. He's identified more than 20,000 different named varieties of apples that were grown in North America 
between 1629 and the year 2000. Over 20,000 varieties. As of 2000, he estimates that we're down to about 4,000 varieties. Seed Saver's goal is to offer apple trees for sale in his catalog, which already features hundreds of heirloom vegetables, flowers, and herbs. So Seed Savers is probably most known for their commercial catalog, and that has about 600 varieties in it. Um, they've kind of been standout all-star varieties that we want to um, make available to the general public. And that's our fundraising mechanism. We sell seed throughout the world, primarily uh, in the United States. We probably had a customer base this year of around probably 40 to 50,000 customers. In addition to its catalog, Seed Savers also publishes a yearbook to facilitate the actual exchange of seed between some of its more than 13,000 members. And that person-to-person -person exchange is really the most resilient system we can have for our seeds. That means that they're out there, it means that they're getting used, and it means that they're relevant and important to people. The organization also sells wholesale to larger growers and in bulk to other seed companies. More than 500 garden centers across the nation carry Seed Savers Exchange retail seed racks. I'd say uh, more than 50% of the revenue that we generate each year comes from seed sales of individual packets. Seed Savers contracts with various growers to help produce its retail products. Mike Bullinger and Katie Prohaska of River Root Farm in Northeast Iowa help grow garlic with a little assistance from their two young children. We'll sell about 50 to 60,000 heads of garlic for seed this uh, year, and uh, they're part of that effort. They're providing the seed stock to us, and then we're growing it out. We're doing all the processing and bringing it back to them as a finished product. Mike and Katie also provide certified organic seedlings for sale at the Seed Savers Exchange Visitor Center at Heritage Farm. Like plants that originally began with a single seed, the exchange has grown over the past 40 years. Its vast seed collection is carefully maintained according to international gene bank protocols. This is the freezer vault, the long-term storage area at Heritage Farm. But the history also is preserved in literary form. Hundreds of letters accompanying seed donations are carefully studied and documented. Each year, more than 20,000 visitors are drawn to Heritage Farm, where the work to preserve agricultural diversity has expanded to include livestock, such as rare, ancient White Park cattle. And while Seed Savers Exchange is Aunt Whaley's top priority, she has found time to write about her passion for preserving botanical history. Her book, Gathering, Memoir of a Seed Saver, is a story of the exchange. I think when we started, we, you know, we felt the urgency too because when a seed is gone, that's, it's gone and it's irreplaceable. For Market to Market, I'm Judy Blank. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain prices trended lower this week as part of a broader commodity and equity sell-off. For the week, December wheat lost nine cents, while the nearby corn contract moved 24 cents lower. Soybeans bucked the bearish trend as the January contract settled with a weekly gain of 27 cents, while nearby meal prices advanced by nearly $20 per ton. In the softs, cotton gave back 80 percent of last week's gain, with a loss of $4.50 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, November Class 3 milk futures gained 48 cents, while the deferred contract moved 25 cents lower. Over in livestock, December cattle lost $2, nearby feeders were off more than 3, and the December lean hog contract moved 72 cents lower. In the financials, the euro lost 75 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil continued its downward trend with a loss of 4.16 per barrel. Comex Gold declined by $11 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost more than 15 points to settle at 6.39 even. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Naomi Bloom. Naomi, welcome back. Hi, Mike. It was a big news day uh, for the broader markets today with the release of America's GDP results. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? We had some decent news this week from the United States, which was finally welcomed. We had third quarter growth of 2% which was much welcomed for many aspects. And of course, second quarter was only at 1.3%. So this is great news and it was enough to keep the market supported for the weekend. And looking though at the bigger picture, uh, we're still struggling. And for the year now, growth is at 1.73%, which is a little bit lower than last year, 
But I would say if things weren't so bad in Europe, prices and our economy might even be doing better. Right now in Europe, of course, today they had some poor news from S&P downgrading some French banks, which weighed on the market a little bit this morning earlier. And now in Spain, they have 25% unemployment, which is just horrible. Uh, one little bit of good news came out of Germany, though. Their five-year um, their um, consumer confidence is at five-year highs, so that was really supportive there. Moving over to Japan, they had a, a rough uh, news week because their exports are down 10%. Of course, their exports are down because Europe isn't buying any of the electronics, and uh, China isn't buying electronics right now either because of their little rift over the islands, mm -hmm. so that's not helping things. And then bringing it back to China also, they had a decent week for news also. They had um, a little spur in growth for over the last three months. Their uh, PMI number came in at uh, just under 50, so things starting to try to get back on track there. The big picture there also, though, they're struggling. They're at three-year lows for their economy. But everything is trying to get back on track. It's just a matter of time. All right. And we did mention earlier in the show uh, crude oil prices falling this week. Where do you see crude oil prices going? And do you see that as, as a bullish factor as we look to the future in terms of economic growth? That's a great question. And I would say right now, because of the supplies that we have for crude oil, it's going to keep prices on the defensive, without a doubt. It's going to be on the defensive with the only thing maybe spurring it higher is if some unforeseen bad thing would happen in the Middle East. Uh, but right now in the bigger picture, I would say that 86 is going to be some support for crude oil with the bigger picture suggesting 80. Now, um, in the larger scale of things, uh, the Middle East and even here in the United States, um, always between 70 and 75 is everybody's break even. So I don't think we'll see the market go below there. We just can't afford that from the production standpoint. All right. Let's move into the commodities and let's talk wheat a little bit. We still had exceptional dryness in parts of the plains. How is that, uh, what's that doing for the wheat futures? Well, the, the Kansas wheat futures, that's uh, um, supporting it right now because the, the uh, planting is going well and it's right on target, but it's just not looking good as far as when it actually comes up. And so we're really concerned about that and the market is watching it. That's what's keeping it supported. Right now for wheat, the, the bigger factor is more the demand factor. And with Ukraine um, cutting exports, that's a big one, and Russia, of course, following suit. Uh, there was a little bit of supportive news this week from Argentina that they would be um, having some quality problems with their production just because it's been a little bit soggier there. So that gave the market a little bit of lift. But overall, we still have wheat in that sideways to slightly lower trend. 840 is support on Chicago December, and $9 is resistance. Any time that prices get to the higher end of that range, be making sales, because until our export market picks up, we're not going to have a reason for the market to get above $9. But if that can happen, the upside would be $10. But most likely, we'll expect to see prices just stay in that sideways range. All right. And now let's talk corn a little bit. Uh, we had kind of a, a bearish week on the, in the corn futures. Where do you see corn going in the near term? I would say over the next week or two, we'll probably see corn stay in this little short-term range that it's been in with 735 as support and 775 as resistance. Uh, the bigger picture suggests $7 still as support with $8 as resistance. End users, if you need to be a buyer, buy down when it's at the $7 end of support because with the supply being so short, the market it will likely hold above $7. Now, on the flip side, we don't have a reason to go above $8 because that's too high and it really kills the demand. So anytime prices get up to the higher end of the range, then be pulling the trigger and making some sales. Keep an eye on the basis because that's been really strong yet, and that's where producers can uh, make the extra pennies. But for the next couple weeks, tighter range, and then probably into year end, I don't think we'll see anything out of the $7 to $8 range. All right, so just sideways movement from here through uh, New Year's. Mm -hmm. All right, now in soybeans, are you seeing a similar uh, action take place, or what's your advice to producers there? Uh, producers there, I would suggest that if we can see the November-January contracts, they're trading about the same. If we can get that back up towards $16, that's a good place to do some sales. Yet I wouldn't be overly aggressive because the ending stocks for the old crop is so tight that if there are any weather hiccups along the way in South America, we could really see the market retest the old highs. Now, that being said, uh, there are some weather concerns starting to pop up in South America. It's really wet in the southern parts of Brazil and in Argentina, and northern Brazil is dry. It's nothing yet to make the market panic, but I think it's enough to keep the market supported overall. All so right. so trade those ranges. All right, and now with the, with the weather in South America, when do you see that having the biggest impact on the futures market? How soon or what should producers be watching for 
timeline-wise with news out of South America? I would say that it's really going to affect the market and hit the market in January, okay. possibly even February, because that would be the biggest part of their growing season. And so until then, prices will likely just stay firm, but the panic button won't be hit unless it's bad weather in that time frame. All right. Well, let's talk cotton briefly. We had a big move last week and another big move this week in the opposite direction. What's going on with that market? Well, it's trapped. It's trapped in this range where 77 and a half is resistance and 70 is support, and it doesn't have a reason to get out of that range. The euphoria last week was about potential quality concerns. With our U.S. crop, there was something with the coarse fibers, and it might affect spinning, and things could break during that process. But in the reality, we have, as a global supply, 270 days worth of product, which is the most ever. So we're not going to see cotton rally. And in fact, even if they cut uh, production next year in terms of acreage, if we go from 12.2 million acres down to 10 million acres, and even if we have good yields this year, it's not going to do a whole lot as far as um, affecting the ending stocks. So cotton is stuck. It's All just right. stuck. And we'll see that for a while. while yeah. All right. Let's talk, uh, let's talk dairy market. Where do you see dairy headed? It's actually a, a favorable picture yet for a while. The milk market right now has actually been more affected by cheese. The block barrel cheese price um, got up to a resistance area on charts near 208. If it can get through there, then it'll go up towards to about 214, which was the summer highs. And cheese demand has been strong lately. And of course, we're heading into holiday season, so that's part of it. The other factor with milk right now, which is going to keep probably the November-December contracts between 20 and 21, is that our production is actually down. And the reason production is down is because we've been bringing more cows to slaughter. And over the last um, nine weeks, the slaughter rate has been over 60,000 head a week, which is a really a su substantial number. So that's why the production is down. And then even looking at first and second quarters of next year, because demand is strong and we expect production to stay lower, it's keeping that market price between 18 and 19. So for now, um, prices look to stay firm, but we don't have any reason to th see anything go substantially higher or lower. Okay. All right. So just things to keep in mind for the producers out mm -hmm. there. Absolutely. All right. Let's look at livestock. As we've seen corn slip <laughs> slightly uh, from its, its summer highs, uh, wh what has that done for the feeder cattle market? Well, the feeder cattle market definitely has held some decent values. Right now, the January contract has some resistance at 150 and ample support at 146. And so it's been a factor with prices coming down that's made it a little bit more appealing to the feeder cattle market. Over the last week or two, the market has kind of blown off the, the feed aspect of it, and it's been trending more along with the live cattle market. So with supplies overall being down, it's going to keep the feeder market well supported. But again, with prices being so high that consumer demand is starting to come into question, which is a really big thing. Um, going into the live cattle, we actually um, saw the choice values go to nine-year highs this week, 199.40, which is just a tremendous value. Um, so again, they're in live cattle because the supplies are so tight, and even our cold storage report this week showed that supplies on hand were down 0.5% from a year ago. So we're keeping up with demand Sort of, but the prices are really high right now that the market is getting a little skittish. And live cattle futures have been trading sideways, the December contract, since April. And it's just kind of stuck in this rut, and it will likely stay there. It's well-supported fundamentally, yet the market is it knows that it doesn't want to get too much higher because it's too scared to, to scare the demand away. And with that in mind, looking from the demand perspective, consumer demand perspective, as we see the GDP increase, is that something the market takes into consideration? Maybe people are feeling a little more wealthy, they're feeling like splurging on beef. Is that Has that been a factor, do you think? I would say that's a great point and something that's going into this. Um, part two of that would be that with the holidays approaching, people are starting to shift towards Christmas presents. Um, but also there's holiday demand from parties and from entertaining and that standpoint. So it's a, it's a tightrope balancing act right now between all of those factors. It's helping, of course, that gasoline prices are lower. Um, and with um, the economy seeming to be a little bit better, there's hope. Um, but at the same time, reality is going to be coming to light over the next few weeks. All right. And what are you seeing in hogs? As we're talking demand, <laughs> we see maybe folks potentially shifting their purchasing from beef to pork, is that is that going to be a real factor in the in the coming months if beef prices stay high? I think it already is a factor. At my little grocery store, the pork was on sale this week, and that was what everyone had in their carts. 
Um, so it's happening. Um, what's interesting with the pork market right now and with hog futures is that the cutout values have been up. Slaughter is 3% higher than a year ago. Cash markets are firm. So everything is current. The weights are down a little bit. And I think the hog market has kind of found this happy little medium spot right now where um, everybody is having a little bit of slice of, of goodness. And the December contract is going to have some resistance at 80. And um, because supplies are so current, it doesn't have a reason to go too much higher than that. And likely, uh, just from profit taking, we'll see the market have a little bit of a setback towards 76. But I would say my outlook on hogs is that we'll start to see it also move into a sideways trend into year end. Um, but it's very mindful of turkey coming and also other holiday demand. All right. Now, as as we look at the upcoming week, we, there's Hurricane Sandy approaching along the coast. Is that going to have any impact? Should folks be concerned about any sort of a sell-off related to that impact in New York, you know, and all those major centers up the East Coast? Is that going to be a factor? That's a great question, and it likely could be. I'm Quite frankly, I'm not quite sure how it would affect things other than um, in infrastructure or maybe people in New York not able to get to work or those types of things. Um, but it's going to be a factor and one that has to be watched closely because if this is the super storm that they say it is, there's potential that we could have power outages for nearly a week, in which case people aren't shopping. So we have to really be mindful of the situation. All right. And uh, one more quick question for folks planning for next year. What's your advice on selling next year's crop? 10% sale on the new crop December. We had December 13 futures hit 640 this week. So for most people, that should be pretty darn close to six bucks. Get that first sale going and start looking at that for the November beans for 13 also. All right. Well, thank you so much, Neil. We really appreciate having you on the show. Right, thank you. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But if you'd like more information from Naomi on where these volatile markets just may be headed, visit the Market Plus page at our website. You'll find expanded market analysis, audio podcasts, and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed and Facebook account, all free at the Market to Market website. Be sure to join us next week when we'll learn how traders are playing the presidential election in a unique political futures market. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success.